Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. It's nice to see um, so many people here interested in uh, and at being at a translation conference and still so many people interested in, uh, in um, documentation. Uh, we are your presenters uh, today. Uh, we've been working together for quite some time and we've known each other uh, for quite some time. Um, my name is Eriko Fahir. Uh, I'm an operations manager. I work for DTC Enterprise. It's a um, US company. We are a service provider and we create uh, content, technical content for developer companies. Um, we also create um, not only product content but, uh, but training materials and we do consulting uh, for technology processes and, uh, and uh, also uh, for content development. Uh, I started out as a technical writer a long time ago, also picked up uh, tasks in project management, did resource management uh, for, uh, for uh, technical writing teams. And um, now I'm, uh, I'm not, besides being an operations manager, I'm a consultant uh, working in technical documentation consultancy projects. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Agnes Tsinkotsky. I'm a user assistance developer at SAP. That's a fairly new, sorry, all of you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's a very new job title. What, what I do is technical writing. I've been doing technical writing for about 15 years. By now, I work as a writer, a documentation coordinator, and a team lead as well. Okay, so why are we here today with Yoliko? Um, in the last couple of years, we've met several translators and writers at various <coughs> conferences, and we've had the impression that we know very little about each other. We don't really know what the other profession does. We live kind of in two separate worlds. Well, we, our aim is today, and not only today, but generally speaking, to bring these two worlds a bit closer, uh, because we think that they are not as separate as we have experienced it before. And uh, our aim is to make sure that uh, we learn about translators, translators learn about tech writers, so we get a bit closer to each other. Because our aim is the same, to create the best product content, both in the source language, what we do, and in the target language, what target languages, what translators do. So as part of that, uh, we founded Teco Madarosak two years ago, in 2006. Um, so two words about Teco Madarosak and Teco Europe. Teco Madarosak is the country organization of Teco Europe. Teco Europe is the largest professional association for technical communicators in Europe and its aim is to connect professionals in technical writing and translation. So at Teco Madarosag, uh, we would like to, or we offer a platform for networking, exchanging experience to learn from each other, and also try to provide opportunities for professional development in technical writing and translation. What are we going to talk about today? Basically, we'll talk about uh, what happens before translation. What happens before you receive a text that needs to be translated. We'll talk about very briefly uh, about technical writing, about the characteristics of technical <laughs> content with some examples. We'll touch upon the authoring flow, some new trends in technical communication, and finally a few words about translation-friendly authoring. So technical writing. Um, Let's start with defining what technical writing is. Well, it says, you know, the name says it all, it's creative technical content, so nothing fancy. Um, there was an American novelist and essay writer, Kurt Vonnegut, who described technical writers really as freaks because they don't express themselves in their writing, but, uh, and they don't tell anything about themselves in their writing. And that's kind of the most important, one of the most important characteristics of technical writing is that uh, that's a basic feature, that it's, uh, it's non-fiction and technical, but it's not about self-expression at all. So even today, technical writers are sometimes considered freaks uh, among the developers mostly software developers, because we do something that they don't like. We do documentation. And um, 
and technical writers, in actually, I mean, most of them who, who like the profession, they enjoy uh, writing. They enjoy writing about technical content, and they enjoy, you know, working together with the, the developers. So. What is technical writing? If we look at the characteristics of the content that we create, um, kind of through that we can define technical writing. We write for a specific audience. Most of the time the, this audience is the users. And uh, for them it is very important that we create content that is relevant, that is useful for them and that is accurate so that they can use it. And in most of the cases, these users have you know, defined goals and we help them to, uh, to actually be able to carry out these goals. So for this, we have to provide the right level of detail in the content that we create. And also, we have to use simple language. So it's not, uh, it's not something that is, uh, that is simple in terms of the subject matter because technical concepts can be very complex. But in, it's, it's simple in terms of the, the use of words, the grammar, grammatical structures. So it's meant to be easily understood. And technical accuracy, I mentioned before, it's extremely important because, uh, because without that, it's not useful for the, for the user if, if they get misleading information. And when we talk about uh, supporting the user and creating content, it, not just text, so it's not just textual, textual content, but it can be any kind of visual support as well. So we have to keep that in mind. And when the user wants to reach a defined goal, they want to carry out something. To be able to do that, they need structured information, they need to follow a certain logic, and we have to be able to create that logic in the content that we develop. And last but not least, all the content that we create, so technical write, all the technical writing that we do has to be user-friendly uh, because we always have to keep in mind the user. Uh, the starting point is actually that technical uh, content, technical documentation is nowadays considered as part of the product. It hasn't been always like that, but today it's considered as an integral part of the product. And this way, the, the technical documentation gets part of the user of the whole user experience as well. So it's important that uh, we we keep that in mind when we uh, when we develop this content. And to be able to create good content that is useful for the user, we have to replicate this uh, this integration in the development as well. So technical writing has to be part of the product development process. So we have to get involved as early as possible in the development phase. Already, we have to be there when we are when we are together defining the basic concepts about the product. So we have to work together with the product owners, and also we have to be there when you know terminology is defined in connection of a product. And in later phases, as the product gets developed, we also have to be an integral part of the development team, and we also have to work with the testers. We call them subject matter experts, and there's a close cooperation between these uh, people because they are the really valuable source of information for us. Uh, they know the product, they know what they are working on, and we have to be able to reach out to them and ask questions. Uh, because when we start using the product, because that's important too, that we can get you know hands-on practice with the product, even if it's software, hardware, if we have that opportunity, it really helps the content creation process. And if it's a software and it has user interface, then it's also important that we work together with the, the UI designers because what they work on, it includes UI text, labels, buttons, error messages, messages or other system messages, and it's all considered part of the technical content, the product content. So we have to be part of that too. And as the content gets developed, uh, there, there has to be certain uh, checkpoints where this content uh, gets reviewed by these subject matter experts, especially for the technical accuracy that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
in the previous slide, I talked about uh, how we work together with the developers. But we always work together with the developers, keeping in mind the users. So that's the user focus that, to, that we bring into the product development and the, and the product content development. Because our main goal is, when we write uh, technical content, is to provide the right content uh, for the users in the right amount of detail, at the right time, right place, because we want to help them to be able to use a product or solve a problem or troubleshoot a uh, situation that they face. So that's very important when uh, developing product content. And actually, this results in you know serving two masters because we represent the voice of the user, we represent the user's focus, but at the same time, at the same time, we work with the developers, and we kind of try to translate uh, the internal information that they have to the user's language. So it's not like translating from one nation's language to the other, but like translating the translating the engineer or developer language to normal human language, so that they um, so that the users can actually use that content. What's the content like? <laughs> okay, so as Liko mentioned, technical content, um, it can be any kind of information that is created and delivered for a certain product to support our users. It can take several formats, it can be delivered in various channels, and it can be targeted at various audiences. So I brought you a couple of examples uh, for that. Um, as I mentioned in the introductory slide, I'm coming from SAP, it's a software company, so most of my examples will be um, examples from the product I've been working on at SAP. Okay, so first, uh, user interface text and messages. These are very important and integral part of the software that our developers create, and uh, as they are texts, actually, they have to be created or reviewed by technical writers. Um, they are a permanent part of the UI shipped with the software directly. Okay, stepping a bit further, in many cases we ship so-called embedded help or in a help. That's again shipped with the software part of the software. It's not a permanent part of the software at all. If the user needs some extra information, uh, he can click on, in this case, on the question mark symbol or any symbol to call up uh, this online help or extra help to read more about certain fields, buttons, functions in the software. Okay, another type of technical content that we very often ship with our products are guided tours. These are again shipped with the software and uh, they guide the users for an example scenario step by step how to complete a certain process, how to create something um, in the system. Now all these three examples are common in the sense that they are shipped within the software, with the software together. I'd like to continue with some other examples that are not shipped with the software, but they are shipped separately or delivered separately. However, they are just as important part of the product as those steps that are part of the software. Okay, so my first example is online help that's usually available on the product information portal <laughs> of the company. In this example, you can see SAP help portal, SAP's help portal, sorry, uh, that's a public uh, portal where you can access uh, documentation for SAP's products. Um, in this example, the, pro uh, the product is SAP Project Companion, and you can see that uh, you have various types of documents available on this portal for that uh, uh, application. And there are many more, it's just I didn't have enough space on the slide. In this portal, you can browse through these documents in an online format. However, if someone prefers to read these documents um, in, for example, a PDF format, of course, he or she can download it and he can access the content, the same content, in a different format that is in standalone PDFs. Okay, we also create uh, visuals, as Ilico mentioned before. It can take several formats. It can be videos, graphics, interactive graphics. A good example of uh, videos can be how-to videos or what's new videos related to a certain product to help our users to get started or learn about the new features in this example. 
And another example for interactive graphics, that's, as you can see, it's not an SAP example. It's about the London 2012 Olympics. It's a venue uh, graphic, venue guide. And it's a very good illustration of how interactive graphics can be used and how useful they can be. And finally, um, we create content for social media, for wikis, uh, <coughs> we create blog posts, vlogs, and so on and so forth. In this example, it's a release information about uh, the Benchon product, SAP Project Companion. Okay, um, as Iliko mentioned before, it's very important to know who we are writing for, who our target audience is, and what their information need is. Different target groups need different kind of information at different levels of complexity, in different formats, using different uh, delivery channels. So I would like to bring in three examples for three different uh, target groups that we typically create content for. for. The first one is um, decision makers. These guys usually need uh, high level information about the product, they don't really need technical details. So in this example, it's a so-called uh, feature scope description that provides some business background for our target audience and also a list of key features without going into details. Second very typical target group we create content for is technical administrators and the developers. Now these guys uh, need technical details. So we create content um, that uh, describes in very detailed format, step by step, uh, using code examples very often, the information they need to set up a system, install a system, configure, maintain, whatever they are doing with it. So examples can be developers guides, installation guides, extensibility guides, and so on and so forth. And finally, but not last but not least, is the users of the product that, create, that we create content for. Again, usually they need a very detailed information about the product, but the focus is not on the technical details, of course, but on the usage of the product. It can take, again, several formats. In this example, um, you can see a getting started guide for a SAP's by design product. And as you can see, it's a very well-structured uh, document. Steps are highlighted. There are even some screenshots to help the users to get started using this product. Okay. Um, however, no matter what type of content you create, who you create it for, how you deliver it, terminology is important in all cases. It's something that you have to work on and deal with. Terms are everywhere. We, we do not even recognize them as such, but they are there. They make communication and, of course, technical communication possible. So that's why standardized and consistent terminology is very, very important for creating a clear, precise, and useful, high-quality documentation. So, um, start technical writing with terminology. That's the first step. You define, use, and promote terms to be used consistently in all content that you create for a certain product. Um, in many cases, we create uh, terminology databases, multilingual databases, where we enter the terms not only in the source language, but in the target languages as well. And also, we have to make sure that these databases are accessible for all stakeholders and also for the users of the product. And as Willico mentioned before, it's crucial that we use familiar, understandable words and uh, phrases to help our users uh, consume what we create for them. last photo on uh, technical content is whatever you do, do it consistently. I think that's again one of the most important aspects of it. Use consistent content elements, like well-defined, predefined formulations and standard phrases, and that applies not only to text, but also to visuals, like style as well, uh, for all the content you create at your company. To help to achieve it, create your style guide. Your style guide will continue set rules to be used by all technical writers, examples to help them get started, and also templates for writers and translators as well. It pays off. It's great support for technical writers because they don't start with a blank page. They have some guidance, they have something to get started by. 
Uh, yeah. We think that it's a support for readers, for our readers as well, because consistent texts are more easy to understand, to consume, and it's a support for translators as well, because inconsistent content is a lot more difficult and less expensive to translate, and it will result uh, in not so good quality translation. Okay, so to continue, let's see how we actually create this content when we, uh, when we write technical content, so how the authoring flow um, looks. So we work in cycles, basically. It all starts with planning, and then we uh, collect input for, uh, for our content, and then we do the authoring, we do a number of reviews, and then if there is need for translation, then the reviewed and approved content gets translated and then it gets delivered. And then it all starts again and again. So it goes in cycles and it goes in hand, hand in hand with the development. Uh, we'll take a quick look at each phase in a bit more detail um, to walk you through this, uh, this cycle. For planning, we mean, you know, what we do when we, um, when we write content is that we have to analyze what target audience we will uh, write for. We have to get to know the basics about the product. We have to think about, you know, the volume, the structure uh, of the content that we are about to create. Also, what deliverables we have to uh, create. We have to collect what input sources there will be available uh, for us and we have to get to know the network of all the stakeholders that we will work with. Once we have this plan kind of in place, uh, then we can get started with the input collection. And that means basically collecting input. And for input collection, we consider many different sources, like all the, all the developers, engineers, testers working uh, on the project, also the internal documents, specifications, design documents, whatever is available, that's very valuable and source for us. And if there are any mock-ups, for example, for UIs, if there are any transfer of information sessions or any internal training uh, within the project, we can use all these different sources uh, as input. And once we have kind of uh, the, the information that is available, we have to go through that process that analyze that what, uh, what we have and see if there is anything missing, if there are any gaps that we still need information to be able to, uh, to write uh, our content. And if there is, then we have to go after that, ask more questions and uh, try to fill these gaps. And then after input collection, there's the authoring. It's not like we collect all input and then we start authoring. It goes back and forth, it goes in parallel. Um, and when authoring, it's not like we sit down and start, you know, from word one and then uh, write in linear format. But it's more about first thinking about the structure, thinking about uh, the different information pieces, how they fit together. Of course, uh, keeping in mind the terminology that we use and also the style that we have to, uh, have to apply to the content. And it's all an iterative process, so especially a bit later we'll talk about the development uh, methodologies that we have to integrate into. So it's an iterative thing and we have to go and write and rewrite again and again um, to be able to create a content that finally gets to users. So once we have kind of mature content, then comes the review. I'll try to speed up a bit because uh, we have 10 minutes left, I think. Okay, so once we think that uh, our content is ma mature enough, we continue with review. There are several types of reviews, and in an ideal situation, our content gets reviewed, uh, goes through all these uh, different types of reviews. So the first one is the peer review. It's usually done by a fellow technical writer or a senior technical writer who checks the document for linguistic accuracy and correctness, and also checks whether we have applied all the rules that are defined and set in this type guide we should use. After peer review, uh, the next step is the technical review. It's conducted by developers and architects, and they check the document for technical accuracy and preciseness. And finally, uh, we have a so-called cross-functional review. 
that's usually carried out by someone who has an overall understanding of the project, someone from the stakeholders, such as a product owner, who checks the overall uh, correctness of the product, the usability, the, sorry, of the documentation, the usability of the documentation as well. Again, most probably we receive comments, we have to go back to altering, we modify the content, maybe create even some new chapters as a result of the review. Okay, once uh, we have a sign-off, we have an approval that the document is ready, then comes translation. Okay, a few ideas here. Um, uh, timeline is very important that when we plan our documentation deliverables, we create a timeline for our activities. We set aside enough time for translation and also we inform our translators about that timeline and changes to that timeline, of course. Secondly, um, it's very important that uh, we are available for questions and feedbacks uh, from translators. And third idea here is context. Translators very often do not have uh, access to the product they are about to translate, so we try to provide as much context information as necessary about the product, about the target audience, whatever is needed. Once the translation is done, uh, the product is released and we publish our documentation. Usually we publish the same content in multiple formats, as you, can see, as you could see on the example, as an HTML hub or PDF documents or even a what's new video can be created from the same content at multiple access points and multiple locations with some variations in the content and in several languages if the content gets translated. Okay, so we thought that so far we have talked about uh, technical writing and technical content in general, so how it is done uh, on a general level, uh, but things are changing around us really, and we can see and we can experience that both on the, both on the software development or the product development side and on the, on the informa information users side, there are new challenges and new requirements that we have to respond at some point. Um, so this thing that everything is speeding up and uh, on development side it's really um, that there is no, not much time uh, to, for development, like uh, development cycles are shorter uh, and iterative and new methodologies are in place and we kind of have to be able to, uh, to get into that. Uh, to be able to cater for the, the content development needs. And products are more complex, but they are not treated like as one big product, but they as features and even if as, as services. So we have to be able to follow that pattern as well. And of course, documentation budget is always you know, too small. So we have to do something about that as well. On the information user side, again, it's Things are speeding up and there's no time, there's uh, not enough uh, uh, time to, to read uh, technical content. Users want uh, everything very quickly and they want to access the content on various devices and they want to do less reading really. And uh, they are not interested in about you know, descriptive kind of content but they, they want to um, carry out some uh, some procedure or, or they want to solve some problem and they want that personalized content for them. So it's, uh, we have to find the answers for that and we do that kind of, um, that we get more into the development, we do collaborative authoring with the developers, we do structured authoring, work with modular content, even molecular content and we work along use cases that developers also use and that's kind of transformed into the documentation and we have to think about new content types that cater for the user's needs and of course about new delivery channels. Uh, well, Tony Stark and his Iron Man, he, he needs information about his surroundings and about how, how uh, his suit is functioning. So inf information is essential for him. And I kind of envision the future user uh, like him in this respect, that information is essential for the user and the information has to be contextual and also easily accessible and personalized. So users want information what is relevant for them at that certain situation. 
And for that, content has to be actionable, which means that it has to not only to be used, but utilized. Um, it's like if we consider IoT, um, in, in, these, uh, in these equipments and products that are part of the, uh, part of, uh, the internet, there should be like sensors and they constantly send data and information about their status and about, uh, about their usage. So they channel this back to, um, back to the system and through that information can be contextualized and personalized. Like for example, in the future, if a refrigerator repairman goes to, to someone's home because the refrigerator is broken, he should be able to get a lot of information from the refrigerator itself about the status, about the problem, and how to solve that problem. For predictive support, it means basically that, uh, that uh, channeling this information and data back to, back to the system, we can uh, think ahead and, and uh, prevent certain situations if we find the right patterns in that data, but that, that's, that's a lot of like data analysis. So this is just very little, you know, looking into the future, but we are, we, we are really going into that direction. Hopefully we still have two more minutes. Um, I'd like to share with you my personal experiences, uh, some lessons I learned on creating content and then creating content that can be easily translated. Um, number one, communicate. As mentioned before, uh, provide the scope of the translation and the plan timeline before translation starts. Inform the translators about changes to the scope or timeline, more terminology, anything that affects uh, their work. And as mentioned before, be available for questions and feedbacks you receive from translators. Okay, number two, provide context and reference material. Again, many cases, uh, translators don't have access to the product uh, they're about to translate, so we try to educate them about the product, the purpose of the document uh, that, is, that needs to be translated, the target group, and so on. It can happen in uh, several ways. We can send them presentations, screenshots, demos, or uh, in our cases, we can create even test users so that they can try out the application in a test system as well. I talked about terminology, it's very important for translation as well, that we use the same term for the same concept. We don't use the synonyms because that will cons uh, confuse not only the readers, but also the translators, and will result in very poor quality. And the terminology database, I mentioned that before. Okay, number four, consistency again. So define a set, a set of rules to be followed by writers and translators because inconsistent texts uh, are very difficult to translate and will result in very poor quality. Avoid idioms and cultural specific symbols. Um, idioms are very difficult to translate. Sometimes they are even not possible to translate. And certain idioms or symbols might not work in certain cultures. They can be offensive. So we try to avoid them as much as possible. And number six, about user interface texts. Uh, uh, never ever use hard-coded texts. Make sure the texts are externalized uh, in language files that can be edited and translated separately. Leave enough space for translated texts on the user interface because in many cases texts on the target language are longer than on the source, in the source language. And again, provide context information for UI texts as well. Okay, and just one more thought here. Um, learn that translators are a really good friend for us because they are among the first ones to read the documentation we create and they uh, consume the documentation from the user's perspective. So we receive very valuable feedback from their side and it helps to improve the content, uh, the quality of the document we create. And with that, uh, we'd like to thank you and your attention. Uh,